I want to say a warm welcome to our campuses, those of you who are joining us online, our extensions all over the world. And today, I want to give a special shout out to all of you who are joining us, all the women in the CIW Women's Prison in Santa Rosa, in the Philippines, in Manila, I should say. Uh, I, before you clap for them, real quick, um, they're growing and they are now one of our largest campuses reaching 1,300 people every weekend. So I want to just give you a shout out and also uh, just express our love to Grace, our pastor there. Can we give a big shout out to Grace and just thank her for her leadership. Today we are in week number two of a message series called Uncommon Sense. And I got to say on the front end of the message, I got a lot of energy around what I'm going to share today. It's a message that's deep in my heart. And somebody said to me last week after the message, you, you seem like you just come alive when you talk about money. And the reason why is because I, I am so passionate about this subject because I've seen God's faithfulness in my life. Stacy and I have been married for 21 years and I have seen these principles that we're looking at throughout the course of this series in my life and countless others experience the blessing as a result of following God's principles in our finances. Now I think for all of us we could agree that there's so much that wars at peace. There's so much that comes against us when it comes to financial freedom. But God has so much to say in his word about living with freedom in the area of our finances. So we looked last week at how do we, how do we understand God's truth about finances. And we looked at God wanting to unlock in us a, a different perspective around his truth. Now today I want to talk to you about mindsets, that God has a mindset around money that will lead to freedom. But I want to begin by sharing about a, a book I read one time. It's called Mindsets by a woman named Carol Dweck, and she is a psychologist. She writes this book, and I'll give you the big thesis of it so you don't have to read it. She said that there are two types of people, and she started doing research with athletes, with students, with people in business, uh, all across the board with the arts, and she noticed there were some people that would grow and keep getting better and be incredibly successful, and some who would be successful earlier in life, and they seemingly would hit a wall. And so she started doing research to say, what's the difference between these two types of people? And she said it was their mindset, that the two groups had a fundamentally different mindset about their lives. And the first group, they had a mindset called a fixed mindset. And what she noticed was even as she did research with students who were 4.0, and then they got to an Ivy League school and their grades went down, that if they had been trained to believe taught to believe, if they deep within their psyche thought that their success was because of their natural prowess, anytime they would encounter a barrier, they would be tempted to give up, and that fixed mindset would interpret back to them a reality that was not true, and they wouldn't continue to grow. On the other hand, she looked at another group of people, and she said they had a growth mindset. And what that meant was that their outlook on life, they weren't successful because of their talent, they actually believed that they made progress because they worked and they had grit and they, they gave their whole self to a mission or a vision. And when they encountered difficulty, they interpreted it as an opportunity to overcome. Now, the reason I'm sharing all of this is because the only difference, this is important, the only difference was mindset. The only difference between the two groups of people was the way that they saw the world around them. Mindsets are powerful. Our mindsets are becoming for us often a self-fulfilling prophecy that we step into. And in your notes, there are a couple points I want to give to you. The first one is my beliefs radically influence who I become. So what I believe radically impacts who I become. The Apostle Paul in just a moment will look at a line he gives to us in Romans 12 too about how our minds are shaping our lives. The other truth is this, my outlook radically influences my outcomes. So the way I see life and the way I see the world radically impacts the outcomes that I get. Now, this is true in finance. And God has a mindset that he wants us to understand in the area of our finances. And I want us to, to start with Romans 12 too. And Paul says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the way you think. 
then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, when it comes to our mindsets about money, studies show us that 77% of Americans are anxious about money. And this is not one of the 23% of stats that are made up on the spot, by the way. That was funny. That was a pastor joke for you. 77% recently in September it was studied. So that means three-fourths of people live with fear about money. This is true internationally as well. This is because of rising inflation. This is because some people are tremendously in debt. In fact, consumer debt is the highest it's ever been in American history, global history as well. So this mindset of fear is impacting so many people. Now, in God's word, I believe there are two ways of thinking about your finances that are so important, thinking about money. The first one is an abundance mindset. And it's the belief that I will have enough for my needs. So it's a mindset that looks at the world through a filter of abundance. I believe that I will have enough for my needs. On the flip is a scarcity mindset. So what a scarcity mindset says, I, I am fearful that I eventually at some point will run out of resources. And there are people who have more money than they could ever spend for the rest of their lives. And they are fearful that at some point it's gonna all run out. And these two mindsets, I want us to look. Some of you are at a place of great fear with your finances. And God wants to bring you into freedom. He wants to bring you into peace. And today we're going to look at how do I face my fears about money? Now we have all different places financially for our church. We have some people that are doing awesome, making a ton of money. We have some people living paycheck to paycheck. Some people that are literally unable, feel like they're unable to pay bills on a regular basis. So we've got everything in between. But this mindset that we're going to see applies to all circumstances. And we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going, to, we're going to go through some of Paul, the apostle's teachings. And I want us to see this letter that Paul is writing, the context of what's happening. So Paul is a church planter. He's started multiple churches. He's gone from town to town, started these new churches, and later would write letters back to the churches to encourage them. Now on this particular occasion in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is informing the church in Corinth, he's coming, he's on his way, and he says, when I get there, I'm going to collect an offering. And when I collect this offering, it's going to go back to the church in Jerusalem. So the church in Jerusalem has need, we're going to collect this offering, we're going to take it to them, we're going to be faithful with it, but we're going to get it to them because they're in need. Now, in the midst of this, Paul, he compares the church in Corinth to the church in Macedonia. And he says, by the way, they've already given their offering and they're really generous. Just thought you should know that. I'm going to put it in the Bible so you see it. And Paul is almost doing a, it seems like a form of holy manipulation with these Corinthians. And he's wanting to get them to understand the power of generosity. And as he's teaching them and getting them ready for this moment, he, he shows them some principles in verses 6 through 15 that have the power to change our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 Verse 6 through 15. I'm going to read through these verses, and then I'm going to pull out three particular choices that we can make that lead to an abundance mindset and ultimately to freedom in our finances. Now, verse 9, chapter 9, verse 6 starts like this. Remember this. I could stop there. Paul is saying this is really important. Like what I'm about to share with you, I want you to, I want you to come back to it later. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And the reason God loves a cheerful giver is because God is a cheerful giver. God loves to bless, loves to give. So he invites us into the fellowship of generosity. The, the original language literally means a hilarious giver. It's this decision that I'm going to trust God with my generosity, and there's a joy in it. So he loves it when we live this way. And on top of that, God is able to bless you abundantly 
So that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. Now you might go back through that verse and just circle all the times he says all. He says all things, all times, having all you need so that you will abound in every good work. He doesn't say so that you can buy the boat you want. He says so that your life would flourish and bless other people. Then he continues. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. So he's quoting Psalm 112. Great psalm. It's worth going and reading it later today. And then he says this. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing with many expressions of thanks to God. Because of this service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them with everyone else and in their prayers for you in their heart their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you thanks be to God for his indescribable gift this is the word of God and Paul is trying to inspire the church in Corinth this was written to them but it's also written for us and when we understand what Paul is saying, it radically changes our perspective and our outlook. And the first point I want us to see is that in order to face my money fears, I have to shift how I see money. And I have to see money through the filter as a seed to be sown. To see money as a seed to be sown. So every time a dollar comes through my hands, that dollar has the potential to do good. That dollar has the potential to bless. And Paul is saying that the seed that comes into your hands, the, the people who sow abundantly reap a harvest. The people who sow sparingly, they reap a sparing harvest. So they're, they're not blessed as a result, and it doesn't make an impact the way that it could. Now, Paul is giving this image of seed. So I've got this bucket of seed. These are pumpkin seeds, by the way, appropriately so at this time of year here in the United States. And these seeds... I'm not going to eat them, which I do love pumpkin seeds. Anybody else like to eat pumpkin seeds? They're really good. These aren't cooked, though, so you have to cook them first. But um, these seeds in my hand have no value. There, there, there's no good that will come out of a pumpkin seed that stays in my hand. So in order for the pumpkin seed to make a difference, it has to be sown into the ground. And when it's sown into the ground, over the course of time, it's going to take root, it's going to come up, and there's going to be a pumpkin that you see during harvest time. So Paul is saying that money is like a seed that is to be sown. Now, what's crazy about this is sometimes what happens is the filter through which I see the seed is often my circumstances, and I can begin to look to the future and say, well, imagine if this had to be enough pumpkin seed for all of California for the next pumpkin season. And I started to ask myself, well, is this going to be enough? I mean, this is only a small little basket full. How far could this go among millions, 40 million Californians? Could it really provide enough pumpkins? Well, if we, like, stopped carving pumpkins, maybe. But, but really, it's, it's, it's actually not enough. So what I could potentially do in my perspective that this is not enough I can make a decision, well, I'm just going to hold on to it because it's not enough. And this is the way a lot of people live. They, what they do is they choose to hoard the seed that is in their hands. So they hold on to it and they put it in their hands and it's like, well, I, I, I'm just going to put some in my pocket for later because I might need it. Now, you might write this down. Hoarders don't get a harvest. So no matter, see how much I can put in my pocket here. Just feeling like i got to load it down. I could keep putting it in my pocket, and it has no value as long as I hoard it and hold on to it. Now, Paul is saying, now i got to preach with this in my pocket. Let me take this out for a second. I didn't think through that. Give me just a second. 
All right. All right, I'm back to normal. So if, I, if my perspective on resources is that I, I bury it, I hoard it, what I will do is I will live with this kind of fear that makes me not invest what God has placed into my hands. See, God has structured the world on the laws of harvest. That when he gives, when we give what he gives, we get in return what we give. So if I give kindness, I get kindness in return. If I live with greed, I experience a gre greed in my heart. The more I live with open hands, the more I experience God's blessing in my life. So come back again. Paul is saying, remember this. If you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow generously, you'll reap generously. Each of you should give what you decided in your heart. So God's not trying to twist our hands or our, our lives. He's, he's actually after our hearts and wants it to be this invitation of joy, joy. But then he comes back. And Paul gives us another perspective that is so crucial because underneath the fear is our perspective on who God is and what God is like. And Paul is saying, you, you actually won't take what is in your hands and sow it if you don't see God for who he is. And notice this next verse. He says, God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. So the second point is this. If I wanna live with, with peace in my finances and not live with fear, it's a decision to trust God to replenish what I release. So it's a decision to trust God that whatever I take and I sow, God can restore what I release. So everything that comes into my hand every time I release and live with an open hand, it makes me position before God to experience his blessing again and again and again. Now, here's the challenge that we face. You and I are limited. We're limited in multiple areas. We're limited, number one, by time. We're limited by space. We're limited by resources. And we're limited by capacity. You might write those down. Time, space, resources, and capacity. So when I think about finances, my tendency could be to look at my finances through the filter of my time, my talent, my resources, my capacity, and realize that at some point all of that about me runs out. And if I interpret my circumstances through the filter of my capacity, I will hoard what's been given to me and I will live with fear of the future. But what Paul is saying is God is not, he is not limited by my limitation. This is so important. God stands outside of time. He stands outside of circumstance. He stands outside of economy. And this is very, very significant. I cannot, there is no way possible, I cannot outgive God. There is no way that I could take something that he places into my hands and just give and give and give and some point outgive the God of unlimited resource. So what Paul is saying is, no matter what your situation, no matter what your circumstance, no matter how far gone your finances might look, some of you are stacked so far under debt right now and it feels like you're drowning, I want you to hear what he is saying. He is saying, God is able in every circumstance to care for every need that you have so that you can abound in every good work. Now, I am preaching passionately, if you can't tell. And the reason I'm preaching so passionately about this is because I meet person after person after person in their journey spiritually who will say things like this. Well, when it comes to releasing resources, I would if I could. I would if I could. Bro, I can't, so I won't but I would if I could. And I wanna respond and say, you could if you would. See, if you, if you would do it, if you would trust God, then you, you, you could do it. But the reason why so many people live on the other side of fear is because they don't test the faithfulness of God. So this is important. There is no way to experience God as trustworthy if I don't trust him. So what we want to do is we want God to be trustworthy, but we don't want to actually have to take the step to put our trust 
in him fully. So it's not until I release, and it's not just finance, it's time, it's energy. It's not until I release what's in my hand that God can replenish and restore. This is another important point worth, worth writing down. If my supply is finite, finite, if my supply is finite, it will always feel like division every time I release. So if the supply is finite, if I'm my supply, I give it up, oh, how in the world is it gonna be replenished? I'm a finite being. But, but if my supply and my source is infinite, Every time I release, I am stepping into multiplication. So I'm releasing and God is providing. I'm releasing and he's providing. Now, I am passionate as well because Stacy and I have so many stories of God's faithfulness and I've met so many followers of Jesus that have applied these principles to their lives and could tell you story after story after story after story. One of mine, Stacy and I were in the San Francisco Bay Area after starting a church and we had lived there for a few years already. We were watching the stock market, or not the, the housing market, go up and up and up and up. And we're like, there's no way we will ever own a home in California. And at the same time, we're like, well, we're gonna, we're gonna save and do our part and trust that at some point, God's gonna make a way for us to buy a home. So we saved. And then the church we were leading at the time, we went into a capital campaign to build buildings and kind of move the vision forward. And I felt prompted by God that we needed to give away the money that we had saved up to buy a house. Now, if I had talked to a financial planner about that, they would have told me that's not very smart. But I felt so compelled by God, it was the right thing for us to do. So we made a decision, and again, I knew with that decision, it might be that we would never own a home in that region. Now, fast forward a couple years, the building moved forward, church did great, we, we made that decision, and then an organization, a mission organization reached out to me and said, hey, um, you're a church planter. We're trying to help church planters own homes in really expensive areas. We want you to be able to be planted to reach your community. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna buy a house. We're gonna let you live in it for free for five years. All you have to pay is the insurance and the taxes. And at the end of the five years, we're gonna sell it to you for the price that we bought it for. And there's no financial planner that will ever say to you, well, let's put a plan in place that will allow you at some point for somebody to buy a house and you live in it. You just cannot make that stuff up. And I have seen over and over and over again, not that same situation, but I have seen God do things outside of circumstances in people's lives. God is not limited by your limitation. And so many people don't test the faithfulness of God, so they don't experience his faithfulness in their life. And what I'm saying to you, from 21 years of age, when Stacy and I first got married, there were so many seasons where we could not rub two nickels together. We did not have money to pay groceries. We were struggling, we were stretched, we were broke, but we made a decision that in the midst of that, we were gonna keep trusting God and keep putting him first. And as a result of that, friends, I can look back and see so many moments where God intervened in our story to do things like that that shouldn't have happened circumstantially. I've heard story after story. Sing I talked to a single mom this week that came to me. She grew up, she was raising her kids when she was in her 20s, and she said, you know, I, am, I, w I was like struggling to put my, pay I was living paycheck to paycheck, struggling to pay my bills, and I decided that I was gonna obey God and put him first. And in the midst of that, I saw God's faithfulness over and over and over again. And I have testimonies in her 60s now looking back of how God cared for her as a single mother. See, God takes a level of responsibility when we trust in him that he doesn't when we don't. There's a kind of provision that comes about from God when I say, God, I'm going to be obedient to you. And I wanna speak very candidly with those of you who are in your 20s right now. There are some of you, you're young, you're about to get married or you recently are married 
and if I could sit down with you in premarital counseling with Stacy, and the four of us were seated there talking about your future marriage, this subject would be one of the most important subjects, I would say, for a healthy life, for a healthy marriage, that if you will get this right when you are young, if you will get it right today, there will be so much of God's fruitfulness and blessing that comes so that you can do like Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, 11, so that you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving back to God. This service is not only supplying the Lord, needs of the Lord's people, but is overflowing with many expressions of thanks to God. Friends, this decision to trust God and test him, there is so much that God can do if I will just put my life wholeheartedly into his hands. And that leads me to the last point. And I'm gonna spend a few moments on this. The last point is to prioritize obedience over outcomes. To prioritize obedience over outcomes. Obedience is my job. Outcome is God's job. So obedience is my responsibility. Outcome is up to God. And a lot of us, we live with fear because we're so obsessed with outcome. Our mind is constantly rolling about future troubles and things that we can't control in our own power. But when I obey God, I'm putting my life into his hands. And I want so deeply for us all to experience the trustworthiness and the faith, faithfulness of God in our lives. But we can't experience that trustworthiness if we don't trust him. And I want to call you, I want to invite you to test God a bit, to say, God, I'm going to, I'm going to trust you in a level that I never have before and experience your faithfulness as a result. I was reminded in prayer today of a time earlier in our ministry when we were 27 years old. And I remember I picked up this book, can't even remember what the name of the book was, but the author was saying, if you want the fullness of God's hand on your life, trust him in three areas, with prayer, with fasting, and with finances, to trust him first with those areas. And so I remember reading that book, and Stacy and I, we were living in Texas, we were broke, we were going to grad school, uh, we were coming close to the end of seminary, and we're about to move to the San Francisco Bay Area to plant a church. And I remember in this journey taking out a note card, and I wrote down a couple of prayers. And I wrote down specifically prayers for God to lead and guide and shape the vision and all of that. And then at the end of it, I had a number in my mind that I believed it would take to launch a church in that region. And so I wrote down that number, and it was a higher number than anything I had, I had ever seen for a new church. But I just wrote it down, just kind of, God, if you do this, this would be awesome. So I took that card, put it in my Bible, and I would pray every day. I would just pull it out, pray, read through the list of these prayers, ask God to provide. And in the midst of those prayers, I felt like God was saying to me on a personal level, Andy, if you're going to pray for this, and you're going to go town to town, and you're going to ask churches and people to support this new church, I want to I challenge you, I felt from God, to dial up our finances. We were already trusting God with our tithe, but I felt like God was saying, Andy, I want you to dial it up. And without telling anybody at the time, Stacy and I just made a decision that we were going to trust in God at a deeper level. So we dialed up our trusting in him. And then over the next year, we just continued our journey. We put together a team. We moved to that area. And then about two years later, I had forgotten about these prayers. I pulled out the Bible. It wasn't the first time I read the Bible for two years. I'd been reading a different one. And, and I, when I pulled out the Bible, this little note card fell out. And when this little note card fell out, I looked at it, and I looked at the prayer. And what I realized was that God had exceeded my expectation and done more than I had been praying for three years ago. And I, I just wept. I was like, God, you are so faithful. You are so good. And there are some of you that God is, he is knocking on the door of your heart. And he is saying, you are living in fear because you're doing it in your own power. You are looking at your seed as though there is no way that I could ever replenish what you release to me. And what God is saying is, open your hands and experience my faithfulness. Test me. 
Now, I, I know there's so many practical things we got to get into. We're going to do that in the coming weeks. We're going to talk about a plan and how to get out of debt and all those things that a lot of people worry about. But I could not skip over the reality that the mindset of abundance and trusting God is at the core. It's at the core, the very essence of the kind of freedom that God wants to give to our lives with finances. And my question for you to wrestle through is, will you... Test, will you test God for just a little bit of time and ask him to, to prove himself faithful? See, if I want to experience God's trustworthiness, I must take the step to trust in him. If I want to experience the trustworthiness of God, I must take the step to trust in him. And as I prayed for you this week, and I asked God to work in your heart, this line, God, God just put so deep in my heart. There are some of you that want God to be trustworthy in your life, but you're not trusting him yet. And God is saying, today is a day to test me and trust me. Some of you who are new to faith, and this moment you're like just on this journey of faith, this is a moment for you to test and see the goodness and the faithfulness of God. See, in Malachi chapter 3, I want to read a couple of verses to you, and they're going to come on the screen. God is speaking to the nation of Israel, and in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, I don't have it in my notes, it'll be on the screen. It says this, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there might be food in my house. And notice this, that God says, test me in this. This is the only place in the Bible that God says, test me. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Verse 11, I will prevent the pests from devouring your crops and the vines your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. And then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord God Almighty. Now I wanna speak to two groups as I'm wrapping up. I wanna speak to those of you who are followers of Jesus. Maybe this is your moment that you've just been holding on to this area of your life and God is saying, I have so much more I want to do in and through you. And I'm inviting you into this cheerful, joyful journey of trusting in me first place with your life. And I'm calling you today to say yes and to stop holding on to that which I've handed to you. As you release it, I can bless you. And as you release your life to me, I can care and strengthen and provide every need you have. Test me in this, he's saying. And then there are some of you that maybe you're new to this and you've never taken just one small step. And I wanna invite all of us just to take one small step. Now, my belief is that the Bible teaches the, the obedience standard that God calls us to for followers of Jesus is to put him first with our tithe. But I also believe there are some of you that just a little step in that direction could make a massive difference in your life. And here's what I want to ask you to do. I want to ask you to do one small step for one short period of time. I want to invite you for one month just to say, God, I'm going to test you with my generosity for 30 days. And here's what I'm going to do. Some of you are not ready to tithe. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Just increase your giving by 1% of your income and just say for just 30 days, I'm going to see what God does. And there are going to be so many stories. Friends, after the first service of the day, I, I got out and I was interacting with people. And I just had people share story after story after story. Oh, let me tell you my story of God's faithfulness. So many moments where God did things that shouldn't have happened on behalf of his people to care for them and provide for them when they trusted in him. So here's how you can take the challenge. As you go to your digital program, I want to invite you, if you will, pull out your phone for just a moment. And you can scan that QR code. It's on your notes. It's also on the back of the chair. But scan that QR code, and there's just a small button that says Trust Challenge. It'll take you about 15 seconds to take that challenge. And in 15 seconds, you can say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to take a step for the next 30 days to put you first in this area of my life. I want these stories of your faithfulness. I want these stories of your provision in my life, so I'm going to trust in you first. As we do this, God will prove himself faithful. Some of you today, there is this great invitation to overcome the fear that you've been holding on to, the fear that's in you, 
And God is saying, you don't have to live that way anymore. There's a kind of peace and freedom that can come about in your heart when you place your life into my hands. Everything that you have into my hands. And today, you can do that. Deep within your soul, you can put your whole heart into the hands of the God who is able to care for you and every need that you have. I want to invite you to do that right now as we pray together. As you're processing in your own heart today your obedience to God. Some of you maybe just deep within your heart need to say, God, I'm, I'm sorry that I have not been living your way. I'm sorry, God, that I have not been joining you in this great journey of trust. And today, just to make a decision, God, I want to trust in you. There's so many blessings on the other side of trusting in God. There's peace, there's joy, there's fulfillment. There's a greater awareness of what God is doing in and through you as you put your life into his hands. Some of you, for the first time today, could do that just to say, God, I'm choosing to trust in you. Others of you, maybe it's a decision to make God first priority in this area of your life and to adopt his abundance mindset about your life and your finances and the things that are happening in the world around us. God, I pray that deep within my soul and our souls together as a church family, that we would live with a kind of faith that we see you as a God of abundance. God, you are more than enough for every need that we have. Thank you, Jesus, that you've taken sin and nailed it to a cross. Thank you that you're a great savior who makes a way that we can be forgiven and experience your love. And God, I just pray that as a whole, our church family would trust in you deeper and we would see your hand at work in our individual lives, your faithfulness over and over again. God, thank you that you are a faithful God and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen, amen.